Hello class, Dr. Bowers Office Hours here, and today we're going to discuss Jonathan Edwards' theses about hell. Here's some study guide questions to help us get started. 1. What are Jonathan Edwards' theses about hell? 2. What is Edwards' argument for his theses? 3. What is the intensity objection to Edwards' argument, and how might he respond? 4. What is the null disrespect objection to Edward's argument? 5. What is the ought can objection to Edward's argument? 6. What is the future good objection to Edward's argument? Okay, as always, when you're taking notes on this lecture, you may want to pause the video and then write down the answers to the study guide questions, or type them up, or crochet them into a sweater, however it is that you best internalize and learn the information. So, hell. That's a pretty big idea, isn't it? And it's a pretty dark idea, too. The idea that an eternal person would go to an eternal torture chamber for a finite crime is more than a little problematic. Indeed, the idea of hell has been so offensive, even to religious people, that usually you need an argument for its existence. And Jonathan Edwards, an American 18th century theologian, provides such an argument. In his essay on the eternity of hell's torments, Jonathan Edwards argues that hell is not only painful, but also eternal. Those are the two things he argues about hell, that hell is painful as well as eternal. And this is the argument for his view. 1. God is infinitely great. 2. If God is infinitely great, then our obligation to respect him is infinitely great. Three. So, our obligation to respect God is infinitely great. 4. If our obligation to respect God is infinitely great, then the sin of disrespecting God is infinitely wicked. 5. So the sin of disrespecting God is infinitely wicked. That's 3 and 4 modus ponens. 6. The severity of a sin's punishment should be proportionate to its wickedness. Seven. So, the sin of disrespecting God warrants an infinite punishment. That just follows from 5 and 6. 8. If the sin of disrespecting God warrants an infinite punishment, then hell is both painful and eternal. So, 9. Hell is both painful and eternal. That follows from 7 and 8 modus ponens. That's Edward's argument for the idea that hell must be eternal and it must be painful. Or, to put it in his own words, then I shall briefly show that it is not inconsistent with the justice of God to inflict an eternal punishment. To evince this, I shall use only one argument, that sin is heinous enough to deserve such a punishment, or such a punishment is no more than proportionate to the demerit of sin. If the evil of sin be infinite, as the punishment is, then it is manifest that the punishment is no more than proportionable to the sin punished and therefore is no more than sin deserves. Now, if the obligation to love, honor, and obey God be infinite, then sin, which is the violation of this obligation, is a violation of infinite obligation, and so is an infinite evil. Again, if God be infinitely worthy of love, honor, and obedience, then our obligation to love, honor, and obey Him is infinitely great. God being infinitely glorious or infinitely worthy of our love, honor, and obedience, our obligation to love, honor, and obey him, and so to avoid all sin, is infinitely great. Further, our obligation to love, honor, and obey God being infinitely great, sin is the violation of infinite obligation, and so is an infinite evil. Once more, sin being an infinite evil deserves an infinite punishment. Such punishment, therefore, is just, which was the thing to be proved. So there we have it. Edward's idea is that because God is infinitely great, our obligation to respect God must be infinitely great. And if we shirk an infinitely great obligation, that's something that's infinitely bad. And if we do something infinitely bad, it warrants an infinitely heinous punishment. That infinitely heinous punishment is hell, thus hell. So how good is this argument exactly? Well, the first thing that we might note is that Strictly speaking, the conclusion of Edward's argument is that there must be an infinite punishment. And then, in the last couple of premises, we go from an infinite punishment to hell which is infinitely long. But we might question this. 
After all, if all you need is an infinite punishment to punish an infinitely bad sin, why not this? Why not have a punishment which is finite in its duration? It's finitely long. It only lasts a finite amount of time, in other words. But the punishment is infinite in its intensity. In other words, consider a headache that hurts infinitely bad, but you have it for five minutes. Is that an infinite punishment? Yeah, it is an infinite punishment. Infinitely bad, infinitely intense, even though it's only finite in length, finite in duration. This is the intensity objection to Edwards' argument. The intensity objection says that, according to Edwards' argument, all you need to punish an infinite sin is some kind of infinite punishment. And a finite punishment can be infinite. It just needs to be infinite in its intensity, not in its duration. Thus, goes the objection, Edwards' argument doesn't really establish that hell has to be eternal, it just has to be infinite, and there is a way to be infinite without being eternal. Now, I think that if Edwards heard this argument, he would probably respond as follows. He would say that the punishment for sin does not need to be just infinite, it also needs to be the sort of thing than which nothing worse can be conceived. Why? Because God is the sort of being than which none greater can be conceived. Right? The idea is that God is so great that if there is any punishment where you can imagine a worse one, you should have the worse one for disrespecting God. Now, to be fair, this is not contained in Edwards' argument, but it is something that you could imagine Edwards appending to the argument, and it's still in the same spirit as the original. Thus, we have the intensity objection to Edwards' argument, as well as how Edwards might respond to it. Moving on, there's also what we might call the null disrespect objection. This targets premise four of the argument. Premise four says that if our obligation to respect God is infinitely great, then a failure to respect God must be infinitely bad. We might challenge this. Why should this follow? We might think that if you have an infinitely great obligation, all this means is that your fulfilling it is infinitely good. It doesn't necessarily follow that your failure to fulfill it is infinitely bad. Why can't it be like this? If you have an infinitely great obligation, it would be infinitely good if you fulfilled it, but it would only be finitely bad if you failed to. There's nothing incoherent in that idea. It's a perfectly conceivable way to understand what an infinite obligation, something very weird otherwise, would be. So why not challenge premise four on those grounds? That's the null disrespect objection. This is different from what we might call the ought-can objection to Edwards' argument. The ought-can objection to Edwards' argument targets premise two, the premise that says if God is infinitely great, then we have an infinitely great obligation to respect God. The ought-can objection targets the premise in the following way. It appeals to a principle of ethics, which many philosophers agree with, which says that ought implies can. Or in other words, if you cannot do something, then there's no way that you could be obligated to do it. For example, I cannot do a thousand sit-ups in a second, no matter how physically fit I am. There's just no way for me to do that. Since I cannot do a thousand sit-ups in a second, there's no way I could meet an obligation to do that. There's no way I could indeed be obligated to do that. Any obligation for me to do a thousand sit-ups in a second is some obligation that cannot be binding on me. The point is that you cannot be obligated to do something that you can't do. You cannot be obligated to, say, fly to the moon by flapping your arms, because that sort of thing is impossible for you to do. That's the idea of the principle of ought implies can. And the ought-can objection to Edwards' argument uses this principle as an objection to Edwards' argument. Now, to explain how this could be used as an objection, let's consider two ways in which someone might be unable to fulfill an obligation. One of the ways, as I just mentioned, is if the deed that they're obligated to perform is impossible. This includes such examples as being obligated to fly to the moon by flapping your arms. But there's also another way for an obligation to be impossible to fulfill, and that is if the obligation is of a sort that the person in question cannot have. Consider the obligation to pay tithing to a church. 
Does that obligation apply to somebody who's not a member of the church? No. Well, why not? Is it because it's impossible for them to pay a tithe? No, no, obviously not. They could pay a tithe. It's just that because they are not members of the church, the ecclesiastical obligation to pay a tithe does not apply to them. It's not the kind of obligation that applies. And so ought implies can goes here. They cannot be obligated to pay a tithe, not because paying a tithe is impossible, but because tithe paying is of an obligatory sort that doesn't apply to them. Now, with this idea that there are some sorts of obligations that might fail to apply to someone, consider the idea, infinite obligations, that is, obligations that are infinitely great, applying to creatures that are finite. Does that make sense? Maybe not. And if you think not, so it is that we would apply the ought-can objection to premise 2 and to reject Edward's argument. The idea is that we are but finite creatures, only capable of finite obligations. Therefore, any infinite obligation is unfitting for us to be subjected to. And now let's move on to the future good objection to Edward's argument. The objection basically goes like this. According to Edward's perspective, God is a retributivist. In other words, God imposes punishments in order to get back at the sinner. If a sinner does something that's a certain level of badness, then God gets them back for it by inflicting an equal amount of badness. That's the perspective that Edwards assumes in his argument. And we might question this perspective. Why would God necessarily be a retributivist? Why couldn't God aim at future goods? If God was aiming at future goods and attempting to achieve the best futures possible, God might be someone who, like St. Origen claimed, would eventually forgive everyone if only they're sorry enough. If God were oriented towards achieving the good in the future, in other words, instead of on retribution, then we would have a very different perspective on what hell is for, and it would be one that's incompatible with premise 6 of Edward's argument. Now, in defense of premise 6, Edwards does cite all kinds of scripture, and the citation of that scripture falls outside the scope of this video, but that is the way that his argument proceeds. Anyway, there's our brief discussion of Jonathan Edwards' argument concerning the existence of hell and its eternity. What do you think? Are these objections telling, or can Edwards escape them? Let me know in the comments. Thanks very much. Stay tuned for other philosophy videos or <laughs> whatever. Thanks, anyone. Bye.